Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by the Hewlett Foundation's Cyber Initiative. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now, a moment to tell you about our sponsor, the Hewlett Foundation's Cyber Initiative. While government and industry focus on the latest cyber threats, we still need more institutions and individuals who take a longer view. They're the people who are helping to create the norms and policies that will keep us all safe in cyberspace. The Cyber Initiative supports a cyber policy field that offers thoughtful solutions to complex challenges for the benefit of societies around the world. Learn more at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. It first came on our radar uh, through a tool that my team has been using for years. That's John DiMaggio. He's a senior cyber intelligence analyst at Symantec. The research we're discussing today is titled THRIP, Espionage Group Hits Satellite, Telecoms, and Defense Companies. Targeted attack analytics is what it's called publicly now, but for years my team has used it and it's just recently something that uh, is publicly available. But anyway, the main point of that or what was exciting about it is it flagged something that was very boring that actually turned into be a a thread that unwinded this whole investigation. It was just what appeared to be an administrator running a legitimate tool called PSExec. And what was interesting about it is the tool flagged this for us and it was simply using this PS exec to install uh, a binary. Well, that was an unknown binary. We didn't know what it was. It wasn't detected as malicious, but it was flagged as suspicious. And the reason when I say flagged as suspicious is, you know, there are binaries that have attributes to them or hooks, for example, if it's a keylogger or something like that. There's specific things or libraries that they might use or pieces of code that are similar. It doesn't always mean that it is something malicious. It could just be that whatever the legitimate tool is, use some aspect of that. So we wanted to take a look and to see what that is. And that's when it really got interesting. When we did our analysis on this unknown binary, not only did it, it capture keystrokes from web browsers, but these were you know updated web browsers. So for example, Firefox recently, for all intents and purposes, redesigned their code completely to try to make it quicker and more effective. Well, a lot of old tools, because of that, were now ineffective. And Chrome is always updating, and that's something bad guys have issues with, is, is how it handles their activity. So this tool, being able to capture credentials from both of those updated versions of the browsers, was interesting Hmm. because the timestamp on it showed it from 2016. However, that can be forged. It was very interesting, but here's where it gets even better. Outside of that, it also took screenshots. All right. So there is no legitimate administrator (laughs) that's going to need to capture your credentials and take screenshots of your computer. And the third piece that was interesting is the name of the file was something close to this, inetview.exe. And they spelled it wrong. They switched a couple of the letters accidentally, I guess, while typing it. So that also stuck out that if it was legitimate, that the chances that it'd be, I mean, you can name anything you want. You can change the names. But it just, again, all these little things together was like, okay, something's going on here. Yeah, it's an interesting mismatch to have software that uh, has a certain amount of sophistication or is at least being kept up to date and then some sloppiness in the naming. Yes, correct. And like I said, it was interesting because the compile time of this thing was 2016, but this new version of Firefox that's come out in the past couple months, again, I'm not a browser expert, but from what what I've read on their webpage, it's been completely uh, updated and rewritten to be more effective and fast. So my point is that the fact that it's working with that 
tells me that these guys are at a minimum that they had this in mind when they were designing it to make sure that it would work with recent browsers. Yeah. Well, let's back up a little bit. Uh, one of the things you describe in the research is is this notion of groups adopting a living off the land tactic. Can you describe yeah. for us, what do you mean there? Before I answer that, if I can, yeah. let me just explain to you what we've traditionally seen by cyber espionage groups. And then when I explain the living off the land part, it'll explain why it's important and what the impact is uh, and why it is significant as opposed to just talking about the living off the land. Sure. So essentially, you know, I've been tracking cyber espionage groups now since 2008. So I've seen a lot come and go and I've seen a lot of the activity. So this particular group, uh, we believe originated from China. So I'm going to reference some of the historical China-based attacks or the tactics from them anyway. What we used to see a lot of is these groups would develop their own custom malware. Now, they would do that for a couple reasons. One, to suit the capability of whatever it was that their operation was to fit their target. The other, though, was to avoid detection. Well, it made it very hard to detect, but once we found it, it was a great high-fidelity indicator to where we could really then pull all of the activity out of our telemetry. And we've got this unbelievable amount of telemetry. So it would make it much easier once we found this custom malware, since it was custom, to just sort of pull out and give us a map of the uh, attack lifecycle. Mm. Well, what we're seeing in this particular case, which is a drastic change from that, um, where we have not seen, at least here at Symantec, uh, very much of coming out of espionage groups from China, is this living off the land technique. And what that means is the adversary in this case, they do have a custom info stealer and a custom backdoor. However, they're using them very sparingly, and I'm going to say that's by design, so it takes a little bit more discipline to use that only when you absolutely have to, as opposed to relying on those tools, because it makes their life easier. Instead, though, what they're doing is, once they get on the network, they're looking at tools that are already in the environment, legitimate tools that are in the environment that will allow them to still compromise their target. So, for example, most Microsoft computers of today are running PowerShell, for example, and that's something that's a, a normal, everyday thing in an environment. So when an adversary is using that to run commands or schedule tasks, it blends in with the legitimate traffic. And of course, it is a legitimate tool, so it's not going to get flagged necessarily by defenders. Same with this PS Exec tool that we saw. That's a uh, Microsoft tool. So it being present on a system that is running a Microsoft operating system is something that's normal that we would see, not on every system, but at least for administrators and you know maybe help desk folks and things like that. So again, by itself, it just sort of blends in. Would it be likely that when the bad guys gained access to a machine that some of these tools would already be there so they wouldn't have to do the installation? Correct. Yes. That takes the whole, you know, downloading and connecting to their infrastructure piece out of it for those tools. Mm. They're already there. They're legitimate. There's other legitimate users likely using this, and it allows them to blend in with the legitimate traffic. And unless you really go look, you know, way down in the weeds to see like what commands were run with this installed and look at the time frames and see what else was happening when this legitimate tool was being used, you probably completely miss it. It's really difficult when they start doing this. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it has to really change the approach that companies and defenders are taking today. And what I mean by that is you can no longer just rely on looking at the bad stuff. You can't just wait for your defenses through automation to flag, hey, this is malicious. Now you need to be proactive and you need to monitor any of these type of tools that have a capability to have any sort of administrative or technical attributes that could affect the environment. So like PS Exec, where there's a whole list of them that are out there. But the point is, is that they now have to look at that legitimate traffic as well if they want to catch this stuff. And while this is a very targeted attack, and all the espionage stuff it is, let's say it's less than 10% of the activity that, that's out there that we see worldwide. Well, just because it's a smaller percent, that doesn't relate to impact. <laughs> the impact of what these smaller targeted groups do is you know, devastating. I mean, just look at some of the past things we've had. You know, just let's look at the healthcare industry. For example, you had a couple of years ago the whole the Aetna, I think it was the compromise and things like that, where they lost the 800 million records or something to that effect. My point is, is that you really now have to be on it with these guys because the impact of these groups of what they're doing is significant to companies and that it is so small and minute the activity. I'm not trying to, you know, saying things to scare people. I'm just being honest. This tactic, it's going to require a proactive approach from defenders in order to identify it. Now, one of the things that caught my eye in the research 
You discussed how it was really the activity that caught your eye. The tools you were using were able to spot the patterns of malicious activity, even though they were using legitimate tools that regularly wouldn't draw attention to themselves. Right. This sentence caught my eye in particular. You said, uh, in short, Thrip's attempts at camouflage blew its cover. Let's dig into yes. that a little bit. That's an interesting insight. Sure. So to explain that, first, let me talk about the tools that my team use that finds things like this. Mm -hmm. And I think we can kind of go from there just to give you an understanding. So I mentioned that we are using a tool that is it now carries the name Targeted Attack Analytics. As I mentioned before, our team's been using that now for quite a bit. The way that we've been using it and the way that that works is over the past couple of years, all of our investigations that we have, we would work with our sort of sister component, which is, so I'm on the attack investigation team. We have a team called TAA, and, and it's not just a tool. And we would work with them when they develop that tool after our investigations, whenever there was something interesting, whether it's commands run or something interesting from a binary, anything that would not normally be flagged, whether it's a behavior or an attribute of a hack tool or malware, we would share with them so that they could build that logic into this tool. Essentially what it is, is it's an AI that goes through huge amounts of data and looks for these sort of anomalies and patterns that we've sort of programmed it by over the years through our espionage and targeted attack investigations. So I'll be honest, you know, when we first talked about this before we actually started implementing it, I wasn't so sure that it was going to really work because, you know, lots of companies come out and say, oh, we've got this stuff. It'll make your analysts work flow easier. Sure. And it's not always the case, but you know, I've got no sales angle. I'm a pure analyst, but I love this tool. It's something that uh, we use in all of our investigations. But what it does is, like I said, it's got an AI that comes through all of our telemetry and it'll pull out anything that fits these anomalies and it uses machine learning and things of that nature. So it just makes it much easier for us to see things. Now, granted, there's always going to be some false positives, but the time spent going through false positives is still much shorter than the time it would take by going through all of our telemetry as an analyst trying to find this needle in the haystack, which like in this investigation with Thrip, where they were you know, downloading that binary uh, was with PS exec. We don't even know how they got in the environment. You know, Usually we see it either at the beginning of the attack phase when they're attempting to uh, get that initial exploit, whether it's through spear phishing or a watering hole, or you know, we get alerted and brought in after the fact, in which case things are being exfilled. You know, in this case, we got flagged and they were already on the network. So hmm. we came in at a, at a different time frame than we normally do in investigations. And that sort of gave us well, not only a different view, but we had to kind of take a different approach in how we investigated this. But this tool made it much easier for me and my fellow analysts to sort of find the initial thread again to pull that sort of unraveled all of this. So let's move on and talk about who they were going after. What do you say this is an espionage operation? Who are they targeting? Yeah, so that's the most interesting to me. That's the most interesting part of this. So the first thing, you know, that we did is once we had that binary that initially started this is we created a signature for it. We were able to then go back and do a rear view look to see if there was previous times where this binary was seen and then look at where you know at our current telemetry of what was actively going on doing so it connected the dots and pulled a relevant traffic out of our telemetry so the first target that we looked at was we didn't know what it was at first but it was a satellite communications company and one of the things that we do we need to know motivation okay you know you don't know right off the bat that it's a cyber espionage group or it's financial crime or whatever the case might be but what we do is we start looking at what systems the adversary is on, what tools and malware were used on each of those systems, and how long they spent on each of those systems. What that sort of does is it gives us a, a path to follow. And when we get to the end of that path, it's usually showing us the high-value system or systems of interest to the adversary. In this particular case, they were systems that were running command and control software for these satellites, as well as having uh, access to a database that facilitated information and data that traversed about the data that traversed through those satellites. So that was the first target. That was obviously very alarming when we saw that. So at that time, if you were just to look at one target and and not look at the entire operation in whole, you might say, okay, command and control, you know, these guys are gonna start making, you know, satellites drop out of the sky, worst case scenario, or something like that. Mm. Well, we continue to look at the targets, and that's why it's so important to never just look at one incident when, when you're profiling an, an actor or looking at it, because it doesn't usually tell you the full story. 
Our next victim shed some light on that, however. Our next victim that we found was in the geospatial uh, imagery and analysis business. Well, let's kind of think about this. This geospatial imagery organization, their prime functionality is to analyze the type of data that's going through the satellites. So these two together, it makes it safe to say to put a theory together, they're probably not going to try and make satellites drop from the sky or they wouldn't have spent their time on this other company that does analysis of that type of imagery. Mm. So I think then it was more probable that we thought, okay, so either they want to learn about the satellites and the technologies or they want to change data that's associated with them, or they just want to learn about you know the different orbit patterns and sort of customers might be going through, or they might have associated with these satellites. But the point is, is that they looked at both the analysis software and the satellite, and again, that just that gives us a little bit better picture. And then when we continued to look at victims, we found two other uh, interesting victims: a telecom provider in Southeast Asia and another organization that had some sort of a defense contractor implementation there. One reason I word it like that is we, we know that that's one of the things that this organization does. They do other things. They do like research and development and stuff like that. Mm. But big picture, putting it all together, you know, when you have all these things with the exception of the defense contractor, the theme that we have here, these are all means of communication with satellites, understanding the data from the satellites, and then these large telecommunication company. The telecommunications company, however, we see that frequently in cyber espionage, but it's usually the customers of that telecommunication company that they're interested in. And this, similar to the satellite and the geospatial companies, they were interested in the operational side of the house. So again, all of this sort of fit together way too nicely to be targets of opportunity. So that sort of told us with high confidence, we can say that these were specific targets of a planned operation. This wasn't by chance. So that kind of started to piece together the espionage angle that we believe is what motivates the thrip attacker. Now, when you have a situation like this where you discover someone doing these sorts of things in the systems, do you ever find yourself sort of stepping back and now that you know what they're doing, rather than simply removing them, keeping an eye on them for a while, you know what they're doing, you know, maybe feeding them some data. You get where I'm going with this? I do get what you're going with this. And so to answer your question, there's a very small window that we have where we can try and, and learn what they're doing versus stopping the activity. So at the end of the day, as much as I have an Intel background, as much as I love <laughs> digging and learning more about the groups, at the end of the day, as a company, our first priority has got to be to protecting a customer. So there is a small window when we're working, once we identify this and working with a customer, that we do have to do things where we can sort of learn that. But to be honest with you, that's not always even necessary because once we have a way to pull that the telemetry associated with these tacks out of our data lake, we can then kind of do a reverse look and we can see everything that they did before we detected them. So that gives us, in this case, let's say it was a four month window of activity, you know, but where no one knew what they were doing, where we could see all their tactics, we could see how they were maneuvering on networks, what they liked to do, what tools they like to use. And this is a great example of where, you know, we wouldn't have to have a lot of time of moving forward to have some intel gathering. We have the historical records because we capture that if our software was on the system when they were doing these activities. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, how often does it happen that uh, in the work that you do, the bad guys will be on to you and, and pivot afterwards? It doesn't happen often where they know... So prior to us creating a signature that just write out blocks their activity. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, when we're looking into these investigations, and let's say, you know, we're working with a customer, we don't really know exactly the, you know, the motivation yet, and they're okay to do some of this more intel gathering monitoring phases, and we have a handle on the attacker. They generally, again, from my experience anyway, since the, the investigations that I've done in the um, four and a half years that I've been at Symantec anyway, that's not been the case. There's not been evidence that they were on to us. Now, what does happen, however, and this is pretty common, usually like in this example, 
we created these signatures and let's say it was a few weeks prior to or even a month prior to writing this between creating the signatures that's going to automatically bring a decrease in activity because you're no longer going to have those successful new successful infections that are going to be effective or or work because we're going to stop it now that we've got these signatures and then if you write a blog about it which we don't do all the time but um, when we do that's the second stage of also you know where we really see a decline in activity because now you've got the signatures and then you've got everybody you know publicly it's it's now known so those two combinations generally will signify a a large decrease in activity now the interesting aspect that we see with uh, espionage groups is it might take time but we'll see them come back again you know like the uh, dragonfly report that we did uh, i think it was last september or last year maybe it was uh, 2017 but anyway we written about them in 2014 and they went away for like a year and then eventually they retooled and came back so it's important to us that not just during the investigation we track these groups but when it's something like this where it's a cyber espionage campaign and it's this aggressive we need to follow them moving forward um, and keep an eye and monitoring them and, and try to not lose track of them because it's important because history tells us they're going to eventually come back now from your point of view when you get an indicator like this it must be fun to get this and sort of set down that path that the you know the game is afoot. You mm-hmm. have something to chase after. It absolutely is. I mean, this was my hobby, actually, before I did it for a living. I was a network engineer by trade when I started out, and this was just a hobby before I uh, was able to do it for a living. But yes, it is extremely, for me anyway, it's extremely exciting. I love the hunt. I love the chase. You know, you always got to keep in mind it's not fun for the victims, so you can't let that excitement, you know, transcend into, you know, your conversations and things with, with the victims. But from a pure technical, scientific aspect of it, it is a very very exciting job. It's it's chasing bad guys, you know. So when we do get, you know, a new investigation or a new indicator, we don't know what it is. It looks very suspicious. And, you know, y- as you connect each dot and you get more and more, it is very exciting. It's it, And it's very interesting to piece together to get that big picture. Now, with the sophistication of these sorts of things that you're seeing and the, the evolution of them, what are your recommendations for people to effectively protect themselves? Obviously, the standard that's already exists needs to continue. You know, the basics, you know, your network defenses, your host based defenses, endpoint protection, you know, all that still stays in place. That does not change because that's going to still capture, you know, 90, 95% of, of all the malicious activity. Now, these well funded, uh, objective oriented attackers like Thrip are a little bit different. And that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier with this whole living off the land aspect that we're seeing, not just with groups originating from China, but we're seeing that with globally is a change that we're starting to see in many uh, advanced groups. So to do that, as I mentioned before, you you need to start taking a proactive approach. So you have to now look at the legitimate activity that tools of privilege, you know, like PS Exec and PowerShell and and, uh, any sort of administrative tool that's in the environment, you have to watch. You have to watch who's using it, what's the commands that are running, times that they're being run. I mean, all of those things, because if you don't look at that legitimate traffic, now, especially if you're in one of these industries that would be a prime target for you know an espionage group, you really need to do a proactive approach and look at the legitimate traffic to find this stuff. Now, sure, you might the, you know the automated defenses will flag on like in this case the the info stealer and the back door that Thrip used that were both custom. But you know in most of these cases they used each one of those once, maybe twice at most. So it would look like a very small activity, and you would miss the whole you know the meat of it of them you know escalating their privileges, traversing the network, searching through directories and, you know, going after something specific, you would just miss all that. So it's just a whole different mindset that needs to happen for defenders moving forward as the attackers are evolving with these new techniques. One of the things in this instance that I think is relevant or important is, you know, there are also publicly available tools that the bad guys are using. It's not all just living off the land, but even by using publicly available tools now, instead of using a custom hack tool, though it's still malicious, like Mimikatz, for example, which we saw with Thrip, that's only used for nefarious purposes for the most part. But I mean, it was, it's been around forever. It was made by a French developer. It, it by itself is, you know, not significant 
significant of, of any one group. But things like that that are publicly available make attribution very hard. So when we're even when we're not seeing just the living off the land, we are also seeing instead of using these custom hack tools now, they're using publicly available hack tools. So it's not just living off the land. It's the whole mindset that attackers are now changing of doing everything they can to deceive and have deception and avoid detection. And this is just the latest technique. So the only message, I guess, like I said, from that is just we've got to change our mindset, proactive defense, look at the good, not just the bad. Our thanks to John DiMaggio from Symantec for joining us. The research is titled THRIP, Espionage Group Hits Satellite, Telecoms, and Defense Companies. You can find it on the Symantec website. Thanks to the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative for sponsoring our show. You can learn more about them at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks to Envail for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envail.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben, editor is John Petrick, technical editor is Chris Russell, executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.